Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 134 of Humanity Rising. Humanity Rising is an initiative of Ubiquity University and now over 350 partnering organizations from literally all over the world who've come together with us to provide Humanity Rising as a common ground, a global commons, if you will, so that people, as we navigate through this extraordinary pandemic uh, can share what it's like being under lockdown and engaging in social distancing, being acutely aware of their health and community well-being, how we can share solutions and strategic formulations to ensure that the world beyond the pandemic uh, is everything we would like it to be. We need to create a better world because scientists are telling us we're literally running out of time. So uh, Humanity Rising made the commitment to keep on for as long as the pandemic um, lasted, which at the time we started back in May, we weren't sure, uh, but it's clear as we uh, stand here today on the 9th of November, uh, that the pandemic is strong and getting worse uh, in many regions around the world. Uh, the United States has set daily records now uh, north of 125, 130,000 people in a single 24 hour period with most of the states now having uh, the intensive care units of their hospitals completely filled. Uh, the cases in the United States have now crossed 10 million, first country in the world to do that. Uh, Europe is in some form of lockdown. There's been a resurgence in China, different parts of Asia, new lockdown in Sri Lanka, uh, in Latin America, Africa. Uh, so uh, we are still alive with this pandemic. Uh, but we had wonderful news over the weekend. Saturday morning uh, in the United States, uh, it was announced uh, that uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris had won the election for the presidency uh, with the largest voter turnout um, in the history of the country. And uh, I must say, um, as a 10th generation uh, American um, whose forebears came to North Carolina, actually, uh, in 1686, and my people have lived uh, every bit of American history to the present day to watch Donald Trump do everything he could to subvert our democratic institutions. And being fearful as we all were that he was gonna succeed. And then watch the American people in the midst of a pandemic of unprecedented proportions, vote in the most massive numbers in our history in an election that the Federal Election Commission and observers from all over the world have judged to be virtually free of any fraud. And to bring in the mandate of a new president at this critical hour uh, could not be more important for the United States, for the world, and most fundamentally for the viability of democracy itself as we face the future. We've just seen democracy in action when ordinary people by the tens and tens of millions of, people, of, of individuals cast their ballots. It shows the power of the local grassroots in national and global politics. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, and today we're gonna celebrate uh, what local communities are doing all over the world because it is at that level you know, we have to think global, absolutely. 
but we need to work locally, starting with our own beings, with what wakes us up at three o'clock in the morning and gets us out of bed with a passion that will not be denied. That's our mission in life. So we're going to be uh, uh, delving into that as a theme for today, the power of the local communities to bring about change, particularly around climate change at this critical time. But before we move into the program, let us just take a minute and take a few deep breaths, close your eyes, and place your attention on your heart. Try to just listen to your heartbeat for one minute. in a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving that you're alive and you can commune with the hearts of people all over the world. One minute. You are talking about very important things. what day it is, but the Thank you, everyone. Uh, just want to note there was a few glitches as we started. Uh, we've had glitches uh, surrounding uh, our efforts today. Uh, many of you got an email uh, that announced last Friday's session with Otto Sharmer. Uh, although the, the main email we send out to all of our uh, registrants had the correct information. Um, our tech guy, it turns out, <laughs> His wife had a baby um, about 12 hours ago. And uh, so that um, kind of took him out of the game for uh, just a little bit. We've been scrambling to, uh, to cover for him. So thank you for your patience. Um, with Zoom, with all technology, sometimes technology happens and uh, we persevere uh, nevertheless. Uh, so let us, let us begin uh, and I would like to introduce Juan Del Rio from Spain, who's one of the activists um, and prime movers in Ecolis, a pan-European network uh, that is working to revitalize local communities uh, in an era of climate change. Uh, he will introduce himself and Ecolis and the panel. 
uh, and we'll have a discussion uh, as usual. Anyone who has any questions or comments, uh, please uh, just uh, write it into the chat. And then just as a reminder, at the end of this session, we have an after chat group and the uh, links will be put now and as we uh, move forward uh, uh, throughout the call. So thank you everyone. Uh, Juan, uh, welcome to Humanity Rising. Thank you, Ian. Thank you so much for the invitation to, to everyone in the Humanity Rising. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here with, with all of you. Uh, well, as you said, my name is Juan del Rio. I'm the Network and Outreach Coordinator in, in Ecolice. And I'm going to be facilitating this, this session with a with few uh, very, very interesting and inspiring people. They are doing a great job in different, in different parts of the world. Um, I'm based in Barcelona. Close to in, in, in Caradeo, close to Barcelona, in a little town. And um, uh, here right now, just I know that there's people from many different places right now. The, the sunset is just uh, the sun is going down, and um, and the night is is entering in, in the in the autumn. So um, I'm going to share my screen briefly to share with you a few things to frame the conversation that we will have today. I hope you, you are watching. Uh, wait one second. No, not yet. Uh, okay, now I think you will be able to see it. Okay, I hope you can see it now. So the session today is titled Communities of Future, Catalyzing Societal Transformation Through Community-Led Action. Uh, this is um, the second Communities of Future session that, that Ecolise is holding this, this year and um, is done in collaboration with, with Ubiquiti University. And I, why is this important? Why uh, that community-led action is important? Well, you all know that currently we are facing um, several immense challenges at a humanity and, and planetary level. We're crossing plenty of different boundaries at the ecological level. We are in the middle of uh, the climate emergency. We are in the sixth mass, mass extinction right now. This um, uh, era, uh, this geological era is uh, called by many geologists as the Anthropocene, as you may already know. And um, we're crossing all these boundaries, all these interconnected boundaries at, at planetary level. At the same time, and connected to that, inequality is increasing in a very uh, strong level. All these different um, crises are, are all interrelated. Uh, indeed, when we talk about many of them, we could consider them as, as symptoms of something deeper. At the end, if we look into root causes of all of these, what we see is a social economical system, a culture that is based on expansion, on going quicker and quicker, on accelerating, on, uh, on patriarchy, et cetera, et cetera. So we are uh, the main cause of this systemic crisis. And it's up to us really like to, to make an effort to try to find a, a, a solution. And I really don't think that the earth needs us here. If uh, life, no matter what we do, in one way or another, we'll be able to adapt and continue. So in this current situation, how can we work at community level to create alternatives to, to foster different types of, of, of life to thrive in, in, in the planet? Currently, there are thousands of initiatives many different movements that they work for regeneration uh, and for sustainability, for resilience uh, uh, all, over the, all over the world. And we talk about transition movement, we talk about permaculture, we talk about eco-villages and many, many more on economy, on, well, I, 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 I could make a huge list, but all of them, um, they're trying to face uh, and work at different level uh, working at diff uh, on different areas, on different topics, 
and um, uh, and one of the current challenges is how can we create synergies? How can we build bridges among all these islands? That's the main reason why Ecolise emerged uh, about seven years ago between uh, people that was working at community level in Europe for sustainability and, and, and climate change. And um, currently Ecolise, uh, the European Network for Community-Led Initiatives on Climate Change and Sustainability has um, members in 17 countries, more than 40 members. All of them are uh, international or national networks and specialized members working on, on sustainability and climate change, all of them community-led uh, or working on community-led. And um, the three main movements that we represent are the transition towns movement, the permaculture movement, and the ecologist movement. Here you can see just few few images. And um, of course, with the current situation, uh, and because our network is really decentralized and and uh, and international, and this is even uh, stronger with the current pandemic, we're very experimental at working online and at uh, working in a participatory way, uh, collaboratively, uh, in, in, in innovating at, at that level. And, um, and um, recently, we launched our new strategy, our new uh, action program for the next 10 years, which is called Communities of Future. And Communities of Future is an action program to mainstream uh, regenerative and transform transformative community -led action uh, initiatives on climate change and sustainability. And Communities of Future inspires and supports local communities to take action for a healthier, fairer, and more sustainable world. I want to show you now a quick video uh, that officially the Communities of Future launch event was just a month and a half ago was an event in, in Brussels and also a decentralized event in many different places. It was supposed to be in person, but, but as many other events, as many other networks and organizations, uh, it was to be uh, online, it had to be online. And, um, and we prepared this video, it's a short video of a minute and a half approximately that explains it very well. So here you will hear our colleague Mia explain it. I'm gonna share it with you. Let's see if you can hear it well. Generating renewable energy, growing food, nurturing local economies, responding creatively to the climate and ecological emergency is the biggest challenge of our time. Throughout Europe, local communities are pioneering a better future, from community gardens to eco-villages, permaculture projects, and transition initiatives. They are building a healthier, fairer, and more sustainable world. This is why Communities for Future is born, to share these experiences to inspire you and your community to take action. So how can we help? By sharing tools and resources, such as guides, manuals, podcasts, and an online space, and also with different events where you can meet and learn from others. And finally, contact. Communities for Future connects you with many other organizations to help support you and your community. Community for Future is bringing together people from all across Europe. So what do you think? Join the thousands of communities across Europe working together to create a happier, fairer, and more sustainable future. Together, we can build a better world. Okay, so within the Communities of Future program that is just starting, uh, one of the key projects are the Communities of Future sessions. And uh, for us, this is the second Communities of Future session. And um, some of them are going to be um, working sessions, and other ones, they're going to be more to spread the word about what we are doing, like this one. And that's why we decided to bring together a few representatives from our network. All of them uh, uh, work in, in, in the wider network in one of these more than, than 40 members that, that we have. And um, these are gonna be our panelists today. 
So we have Alexander Tudosen. He represents the permaculture. He's going to represent here the permaculture movement. He works for the Permaculture Research Institute in Romania. We will have also Alisa Dendro, in this case representing Eco Villages. Uh, he's president in Sonderbin Eco Village in Sweden, and she's president of the Baltic Eco Village Network. Um, and then we will have also Filipa Pimentel from Portugal, uh, living in Brussels. And she's going to be a representative of the transition. Uh, she's representative of the transition network, and she will be talking about the transition movement. She's currently coordinating the National Transition Hub Circle. For me, it's a great pleasure to have you all here with, uh, with us uh, in this session titled Catalyzing Social Transformation Through Community Led Action. So uh, you can, if you can please share on your camera, I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen here. Uh, yes, let me see. What? No, no, no. Uh, exactly. Thank you. Okay, great. So, welcome everyone. Um, you are not seeing my screen anymore, isn't it? That's that's fine now. I think perfect. And also, uh, I would like to to present Paulina Helle. Paulina Helle is part of the organization, and she's going to be supporting us. If you can put your camera on, please, Paulina. That that's great. So Paulina is, is working together with me and she has been uh, co-organizing this, this session. She will be uh, also supporting us with a chat, with the questions, and also together with the humanity rising team in, in anything that, that may, be, may be needed. So welcome, Alisa, Filipa, and, and Alex. It's a, it's a great pressure, pleasure. And um, the idea for the next 70 minutes or so, a little bit less, uh, is going to have a is, is to have a, together a conversation about about this topic. And first of all, I would like to, to invite each of you to present briefly and present a little bit your movement. Imagine that you have to that you are in a in an elevator and you need to explain, you know, in in a minute more or less which are the main characteristics of. Uh, and I know the boundaries, you know, are all and and many of the community initiatives can take one thing from here and from there. But if you to define uh, your yourself and your your movement, how it could be. So, Filipa, would you like to start? And yeah. Yes, of course. So my name is Filipa. I'm Portuguese, living in Brussels. I uh, I came to Brussels twenty years ago to be part of the EU institutions, and I worked for a while as a uh, a political advisor until. I heard about the transition movement and somehow I had an epiphany and I just quit my job as a crazy woman I am. And I started an initiative in Portugal and shortly after that, I started to work with Transition Network. So the first non-English person in the team. Uh, so if I would if I would explain what the movement is about, the transition movement, I would use some of the words that really inspired me, Jim, that in your introduction. So, um, so the transition is imagine an ongoing global social experiment in which communities get together to reimagine and try to rebuild the world that we want to live in. Right, and, and they do that by, by uh, searching what is for us a healthy human culture. So for me, this is, this is the concept of the transition movement. So it is inspirational, it is positive, it is experimental, it is extremely diverse because it's like communities, they want to address global problems, global challenges in what can we do in our place, in our context, and that we feel like doing that. So this means that you have thousands and thousands and thousands of initiatives doing things very different from each other. And they are connected to each other and they share that inspiration via 
storytelling and they they support each other and there is transition network as like the, the the supporting structure with others that support this movement to be inspired and to get the resources and we learn on the way so this movement started in 2005 in Totnes with a small group of friends and since then it has been growing and growing and growing to the moment that is present in 50 countries. We don't know exactly how many initiatives are there because uh, only a little part register in the international website. But we know that there are many, many more than almost 2000 there uh, that are registered. Um, so again, starting local to address global challenges, um, there is this very, very important uh, intention to nurture and to support each other with a lot of compassion and to create spaces for discussion and about really difficult conversations. So, and you might have heard some of the principles of the transition movement, one of the you know, uh, respect resources and look for resilience, local resilience. There is the inclusivity and social, social justice. Subsidiarity, because the governance is, and the power is, is shared and you decide what to do in your place. So it's completely decentralized. Um, there is this balance, head, heart and hands, that is very important. Change needs to to happen in a systemic way with all skills involved. Um, it is an experimental network in which people share what they, 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 they their successes, but their failures as well. Um, and, and the collaboration with others is really important. And this is how Ecolise comes in and why Transition Network is part of that. Change needs to happen in a, in a systemic complex system, in a system that is very complex. We can have identities and choose how to act, but we need to be together and supporting each other. So competition should not happen in when we want to really to change stuff really deeply. Um, and then there is the last one, there is the positive visioning. We need a common vision of the future that we want to, you know, to nurture and to look for and to work for. And yeah, and doing that in a very creative and posi positive way. So this is how I, I would re uh, describe my heart movement. Thank That's you. me. Thank you for the, for the introduction. Um, Alex, would you like to continue? Would you like to introduce yourself and, and briefly about permaculture? Go ahead. All right. Hello, everybody. Hello, dear friends. I haven't seen you in a long while. I'm yeah. Alex from Romania. Uh, I practice permaculture. I've been practic practicing permaculture since 2014, even if I didn't know it in the beginning. Um, I'm part of the Permaculture Research Institute in Romania. Uh, my story began in 2014. I was working, I don't know, just basic jobs, not being very happy for myself. And actually, I was in a place of a lot of pain. And what I thought about, okay, can there be a different world? Can there be stuff that's very enlightening? And I was studying anthropology, and I was reading about all these wonderful, let's say, traditional societies and the intermingling of the sacred in everyday life and tradition and all sorts of stuff. And I was wondering, where is this? And I, find it, I found it in traditional Romanian rural society, a part of it. But deep down inside, I wanted to retrace the steps of those early anthropologists and go native, you know, go on that voyage. So in 2014, I left Romania and I went on this woofing world tour where I got a super taste of what permaculture and community living and eco-village living and, you know, this alternative life we're living uh, is all about. 2015 had me go even deeper as a European volunteer in the European Voluntary Service in Luxembourg in the Center for Ecological Learning, where I really got to see how it is to be a part of a wider like national network, combining all the people doing uh, alternative stuff. 
And that's where I learned actually how to grow vegetables, which really served in my life because I went back to Romania and I grew veggies for one year and a half. And then everything just skyrocketed when I, me, I was alone and I joined the Permaculture Research Institute and I joined the, the some urban gardening project. Then uh, I started this uh, urban permaculture foodscaping, uh, landscaping services company. And yeah, things have just uh, skyrocketed since then. Right now where uh, we've bought uh, uh, some land for a farm, our Community Garden Network has, re has reached 20 gardens on a national scale. And we're going to start Romania's first regenerative farm. <laughs> and uh, that's actually the basis for a larger farm network. So yeah, really combining permaculture and eco villages and uh, you know, residential, what? And Alex, you wanted to you say could, something? You could like, if you could define permaculture for the ones that they don't know what it is in a few okay. sentences. Okay, yeah, like, so yeah. when people say permaculture, we imagine the raised beds and the chickens and everything. Well, yes, the, uh, permaculture is all about technology, appropriate technology, appropriate regenerative technology, but it's a, actually a philosophy of life. And it's a philosophy of life and it's a philosophy of design. And it embodies, and, and it says that everything you do must embody these three ethics, earth care, people care, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, you know, the, okay, we call it future care, but it's something about sharing uh, uh, resources ethically. Um, we use, uh, the big thing about permaculture is that we use uh, nature as a basic model for everything and we use natural succession uh, as a metaphor, let's say, for societal development. So we take all these ethics and uh, we look at them. Okay, earth care, what are we doing? Yes, we're caring for the earth, but how? we're recreating in the guise of nature. We are recreating perennial systems and planting for our children and for the next generation. So they only need to focus on harvesting, processing, and maybe celebrating their life, let's say. And do remember that nature's growth model is exponential. So yeah, if we don't see any results now, don't worry because they will be we overflowing. Uh, a part of it is quality of life. So, okay, earth care, earth care. We understand that, but people care. It's not only about the other, it's about myself. Can I be in tip top shape so as to not spill over my emotional trauma into my social interaction? Can I be okay with, uh, with myself to be like a shining beacon of like calm and stability and clarity for the other people? And can I be, it all begins with, can I be rested enough? Can I respect myself enough so I'm worthy of respect and I can also respect other people? And economy, yes, that's the, the last part about economy and resources. Yes, we are growing vegetables. We are growing things. Uh, we sell them, we invest, but how do we invest? Do we invest in, we, we try to invest ethically. So, you know, sustainable regenerative sources and we use money in the same metaphor of nature, like money is a nutrient. Where do you put your nutrient? Do you put it in the middle of the road or do you put it in a place that really matters? Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah. yeah thank I could you. go on for hours, but... No, that's fine, that's fine. Like this, let's... Yeah. let's if let's... you need somebody to go on for hours, I'm here. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Alex. So let's go with, with Alisa. So Alisa, welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Over, over to you if you want to present briefly and, and explain a little bit about Eco Villages. In, yes, in thank you. I'm very honored to be here and to also bring Eco Villages uh, into this uh, discussion. It's sort of uh, three sisters uh, within Ecolis, uh, Transition yeah. Town Movement, Permaculture and Eco Villages. Their development have always been interwoman and inter-inspired. Um, Personally, a few words about myself. Uh, I grew up in a very small, simple uh, town in Kazakhstan, in Central Asia. Um, I lived in different places. I ended up to live in Sweden for the last seven and a half years. Uh, out of them, five and a half years, I live in Surubin Permaculture Eco Village, uh, in the very middle of the Baltic Sea, uh, quite far from where I'm from initially. Uh, but also the place where I live in is very intercultural. So we bring different backgrounds to build together 
a different model of life. And this is what ecovillages basically do. So to um, brief about it um, quickly for those who don't know, ecovillages uh, are initiatives initiated by people for other people. Um, they can vary in size, they can vary in culture. The main idea is that people try to build the model of life which they see more suitable for us as humans and for the planet. And of course, these models are very diverse. They differ a lot according to what kind of group comes together. The main idea is that there are uh, four dimensions which are addressed in these communities. I will try to share the screen um, to show briefly. So here is a approximate map of some of the eco-villages around the world. I can also give you the link later on. The same as for transition town movement. Uh, it's very difficult to count because very few actually register. For example, <laughs> if you go to the post-Soviet Union, there's almost no uh, eco-villages registered, while many traditional intentional communities exist also. If you go to Europe, there's more registered, but even more not registered. Uh, same with, um, yeah, any other continent. So here would be the map uh, which you can pick on while we are speaking and also discover what are the um, ecovillages in your region. And uh, uh, what I try to say is that all the ecovillages in trying to recuperate uh, four dimensions, which is social, how we uh, function with each other, how do we relearn to live together as a community, cultural, how do we view the world around us and ourselves, how do we deal with our traumas and our celebrations, ecological dimension, how do we interact with the world around, how do we regenerate the ecosystem, how do we use resources, and economic. I don't think I need to uh, speak much about broken economic system and uh, how it affects our lives. So just also try to make a local, um, more self-sufficient environment for people and nature to thrive. And all of this comes together in what is called integral design, which attempts to address all different um, aspects of life. So one common thing for the ecovillages is that basically it is an attempt to recreate the model of society. And of course, when you do this, you cannot get stuck only with one aspect. You cannot focus only on relations or only on producing food or only on producing energy. You kind of pushed into <laughs> experimenting with every single aspect of life from uh, technical solutions to social relations. You cannot cut out one part and focus on another. You can distribute roles um, in your small society, but one way or another, you learn about the whole system in a very practical way. And there is no way out of it when you when you uh, came into so with community or technical solutions, financial solutions, everything comes in play. Um, yeah, that's what I could say, and uh, this is why I'm still interested in it, um, even though I see how difficult it is also to be in part of this uh, contra movement. But um, yeah, hopefully there will be more time to speak about right. what we actually oh, do. Right, Alisa, thank thank you so much. We're just warming up yet. This is part of the of the conversation together. So so thank you, Alisa, and, and thank you, Philippe and Alex. Yeah, this is what just kind of um, what we would say in, in Spain, like kind of a tapa, no, like a little taste, you know, for for what, what you're doing. But I would like to go a little bit deeper um, because uh, I think the the most inspiring way to arrive to people. And to, it's, it's about sharing our stories, sharing our experiences. Um, and I would like to, to, to make a round now going through some of these stories that, that, uh, that, that were important for you, some of the achievements that you were able to, to, to have in your own uh, community or in your own project. And um, I mean, I'd like each of you to share one of these stories, but I don't have any specific order. So whoever feels like more uh, and I don't know, open for that, you can start and then we will go to someone else. So maybe Philippa, if you... I can, I can start. Um, I can start. I, I can start telling you a story that um, it, it, it has happened some time ago, but has been 
uh, a source of a lot of energy for myself. So, and Juan knows it because he was part of it. Um, so um, my transition initiative, um, it, uh, that I, this is how I, I stepped in the movement, was founding a, a local initiative in Portugal in a region uh, that is very poor in Portugal, near, near Spain in the center. And during the crisis, really, really, it really struggled, really, really struggled, very shocking the way that things were. And the transition, net, uh, the transition initiative there, with all the stuff that we were learning and the tools and the way of thinking and all that, uh, acted as a convener that it happens very often initiatives um, being like a convener for a whole community that is not them really members of, of the transition initiative. But what happened was that um, we agree, we, we decided to make an international conference on gift economy because there is there was no money there we saw that people were very depressed they did not act because they you know when when there is this depression um in in places that were very badly treated with the time uh, the economy crashes you know this kind of stuff and people get like a, a depression with no strength to act so we wanted to bring something that would make people think. And we invited Charles Eisenstein to come in, but we didn't want to do like a normal conference with people coming in and then go away only for the theorists and philosophers and things like that. We didn't want that at all. So we put in place all the tools we, we knew about collective intelligence, um, uh, uh, in a transition, really supporting people. And we did a conference that was, I, I tell you what about this conference was about, was three days, head, heart, and hands, um, with uh, more than 400 uh, participants from 11 countries, but we lost the count because all the community participated. In the beginning, there were four organizers who, who started the, the, the organization. And then at, in the end, organizers were 150 more or less. The youngest was eight. It was the, uh, the eight-year-old was the, the coordinator of the garbage and you had an 80 something person uh, was the coordinator. I don't really remember, but we, 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 we did all that with a budget of 2000 euros. And uh, there was, there was um, we gave 500 meals, provided 500 meals with no money involved and all that with everyone who, one of the things that we did at the start was a dreaming session with the people of the community and with like, um, uh, uh, there, were, there were scribes that would uh, uh, draw and write on the walls what were the dreams of the people and all of them m were made uh, real. So, and, and it was a super difficult work very difficult work. We did that within six months, that is quite short. And I, I learned so much. And I still, after so much, so much time, like five or six years, I think six years now, I still have calls sometimes. One of these days, I got a call from Australia asking me about this thing in this little town in Portugal. So I go, I go back there very often for the pain and for the, for the, the miracles that you can live if you do it with integrity, coherence, and I, yeah, that's me. Thank you, Felipa. 
Yeah, I, I had the pleasure to participate in Ayudada. Ayudada is the name of the event, and it was really, really, really inspiring and transformative. I've just put the link on the chat for, for, for everyone. Yeah. So, Alisa, would you like to, to go next? I'll try. Um, yeah, I find on. the question, uh, yeah, I find the question quite tricky actually when I got to think about it, <laughs> because it addresses sort of your contribution to the network, and I, I don't, I don't find any um, successful story which I could allocate to my own um, contribution because it's always done in amazing groups with very inspiring and very ded dedicated people in this network, but something which came to my mind the very first. Um, and somehow responds also to the challenges in the world now is something connected to crossing the borders. Because even though we try to build a new world and we speak a lot about the change in our networks, we very often, I find, operate with um, the same political conditioning and the same cultural um, stereotypes, which we carry from the old paradigm and old heritage. And we very often, even in our pro-change projects, operate uh, with rather borders than people. And uh, for me, this is something important also as a person who <laughs> lived in different parts of the world. And uh, these past years, um, as I've been involved in grassroots initiatives, it was important for me to work on one hand uh, with European grassroots initiatives, because I landed here <laughs> for some reason, but also to um, connect to and learn about uh, initiatives in other parts of the world, and particularly in Russia. I speak the language, it was a bit easier for me, even though I escaped the country, it was a very big conflict inside me of um, not agreeing with politics and trying to merge uh, these sites inside me and trying to merge these networks also, it was a big transformative path for me and remains. So something I can think about, um, not as a success, but as a path which inspires me, is when we um, organize events across those stereotypes and across those borders, because I see how our <laughs> minds are shaped still by the iron curtains and colonial thoughts. So whatever parts of the world we refer to be it Europe and, and for Soviet or Europe and Africa, it's, it's still so much heritage and uh, sometimes it's difficult to cross, cross it and work people to people. So for me, a big inspiration was to organize similar events to how Felipe described it, maybe with less um, loud voices, but uh, bringing many people from Europe to the very north of Russia on their own expenses, not being funded, organizing events totally um, based on gift economy, just for the sake of people meeting one another. And now throughout the years, seeing how in this, especially in, in online spaces, how here and there, uh, I see the connections growing up and people getting together and presenting the approaches, the technical solutions, but also social struggles beyond political borders. And some of them also know, ah, this one has grown from the event which we organized and we struggled so much to make it happen. But years after the heritage um, spills into yeah, seeds growing of cooperation and people seeing each other beyond the stereotypes working together so that uh, this is this remains a big inspiration for me and i hope that we despite the borders and geographical distance and covid can actually learn to work within the culture of our networks and our movements and not so much within the borders and political heritage uh, in which we are sort of imprisoned yeah i think i leave it here for the interpretations <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I, 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 I totally agree. I mean, the current political borders are just made by, by humans, of course, but, uh, but we need to, I mean, we need to go beyond that. Absolutely. absolutely. Thank you so, so much. Lisa. Alex, would you like to share one of your many, because I know you have many of interesting stories in your life. So one that you think can be inspiring for, for, for all of us, something connected to permaculture, to community-led initiatives, Please go ahead. Well, I don't have a baby, but uh, looking at the development of these gardens was like watching a baby grow in the first year. He's super dependent on you, on you. You give him everything, you put his food in his mouth, etc., etc. But um, as it was the case in Romania in 2017, okay, we made the garden, like the institute implemented the gardens, 
a lot of facilitation, a lot of bringing people here, a lot of going through people's, oh, I don't think this is going to work. This is uh, not a really good idea. You're going to get robbed, etc., etc. But then, okay, it grew, it grew. People learned how to do it. And um, I, today, actually, I came to do maintenance and I didn't do much. I just walked around and people were happy to, to join and rake leaves, cut grass, uh, etc., etc. So yeah, I really felt really good. And in like in the first lockdown, I came here and like in Romania, everybody was like super under lockdown. And I came here and I entered the garden and boom, I looked left and it was like super, uh, how, how, how shall I say, like stereotypical. I could not believe that level of like perfection like families with children and people working and having fun and tending to their vegetables. And people were like, they could distance themselves. And they, I think now people really understood the role of these community gardens. When you don't have access to nature, you don't have access, you, you're supposed to be confined to your house. And yeah, I think the, uh, the growth of it, I'm obsessed by this concept of growth. I think the growth, like, okay, one garden here, two gardens, boom, more people get interested. Um, the corporations get interested, the city hall gets interested, uh, funding starts pouring in for people and for materials. And it, it, it all leads to a model that's, that's known, that's replicable. And uh, that like became the inspiration for uh, food, the, this foodscaping company. Like I think the first permaculture edible plant uh, landscape gardening company in Bucharest, let's say. Um, and it all culminated with us having this farm, all the know-how there. So I'm, I'm a big fan of building upon building upon building upon. But yeah, and as Alisa said, it's not my accomplishment. It's not her accomplishment. It's a community of like biodiverse people bringing their skills together and bringing all those like micronutrients necessary to make things happen and grow in scale and be pollinated onwards by either ourselves as big bold bumblebees or by other little bees uh, tasting a little bit of our nectar and uh, yeah, moving on and telling the story and inspiring and yeah, consulting and making things like spread in the seed metaphor. I saw somebody using the seeding metaphor. Thank you so much, Alex. I don't know if you have heard the, the sentence from Eduardo Galeano from Uruguay. He's one of, to me, he's one of the most inspiring people I've, I've ever read. Of many little people in many little places, doing little things can change the world. So for me, um, I mean, when I look at you and when I think in myself and many, many other people there in our networks and many different uh, levels, you know, that the people where I share in the food cooperative, but also in the permaculture garden, the local transition initiative, the local currency, uh, when I connect with all of you through, I mean, right now online and, but uh, of course, when we meet in person that I'm really missing that, I, I know it's, it's, it's very hard, but uh, fortunately, we have this type of technologies, even though it's not enough, we need human uh, contact. Um, but um, every time that I go to, well, right now I'm not traveling a lot, but for my work um, in the last 15 years, uh, supporting community-led initiative processes, I've, I've visited many different places. And every place you go, if you really look what is going on there, always you will find people that they are doing amazing things. And it may seem that it's small, but there are thousands of people like this, uh, thousands of little projects. And, and I think uh, this is one of the, of the most uh, uh, amazing things. And when I was listening to you, I was thinking in, in uh, one of these stories that for me was, was important. Uh, and um, it came to me uh, before the Occupy um, Street, came into the Anglo-Saxon world. It happened first in, in Spain with, uh, with the Indignados movement. And in, it was in 2011. And we occupied in all the, the, the squares of the, main, uh, of the main cities. And for example, in Barcelona, I don't know if any of the participants have been there, but in Plaza Catalunya, the main, the main square, we were sleeping there for many, for many weeks. And the gardens that right now they have in Fontaine, we have, we, we had a permaculture garden there close to, to, the, to the main 
to um, shops and things like that. No, so um, sure, it was it didn't last much, but uh, but all that type of things, uh, I think they are very they they make a, a change. No, and then now now I would like to to go to this last uh, question to to all of you before we we open for for the for the participants, the rest of the participants in the chat. And I would like to explore a little bit more on how can we catalyze uh, effectively this community-led action? Uh, how can we contribute at, uh, when we work at community-led le uh, level uh, to, to foster systemic transformation, okay? So I'd like to start with, with Alisa, uh, if it's fine for you. And I'd like to ask you, um, what do you think is the role of community-led initiatives uh, in a wider societal transformation? And how can we ensure impact? I know it's a very big question, but if you can just give your opinion a few ideas on that, that would mm -hmm. be great. Thank you, Lisa. So what is the role of Eco-Village and Ecolis movement in the larger yeah. transformation? Yeah, I mean, in your experience, but at this moment, I think we are crossing boundaries, as you, as you, uh, as you said, on frontier. And it's not a question of brands. I don't care if we call them transition, permaculture, or whatever. It's a question of working together and collaborating. So in your experience? Exactly. I, I would go with a metaphor of a burning house. I couldn't trace the root of this oh. metaphor. It's very common in our networks that our hair house is on fire and uh, the majority of the population resists to get this negative feedback that something is wrong and uh, tries to pretend that everything is fine. And then there are people um, running out and shouting that the fire is actually here, the house is burning, um, which is the role of the climate movements and other protesters and social movements, which I respect a lot and also belong to. And then there are people who walk outside uh, calmly and just start to build another house or a small playground. <laughs> And this is how I see uh, the transition movement, the eco-villagers, the permaculture movement, all our um, movements basically, is an attempt to create a different model. And maybe it is not the future house and surely when the crisis comes, the whole society will not be able to move into the models which are there now, but it is a playground where people um, A, learn how to use both practical and social technologies which we will need to adapt to. We will need to get much more self-sufficient. We will need to learn how to build our economy locally. We will need to learn to live together. We simply will not be able to stay in separate apartments. So we need to uh, relearn our whole well way of being and organizing our communities. Uh, B, it functions as an inspiration for people who are running out of the house and uh, falling into grief and anger because the existing system doesn't uh, operate according to the to the um, limits of the of the earth, which Juan also presented in the beginning. So there is a lot of uh, distrust in the current political system and inability to act constructively. So in this case, those constructive movements um, function as a beacon of hope. Like, hey, we can rebuild. We can live differently. And this is very important, especially also in COVID times when so many people felt um, mental struggle of actually coping with existing system. And then knowing that they are people working towards solutions, this is also very inspiring. And becoming of this solution is uh, for many people functions as a rehabilitation from the mental distress. And um, the third function I see as a basically um, in uh, introducing to the people who still believe that the fire is not here, that the house is not burning, that actually there is another model and when they see this other model, when people come here with rather critical mindset and see that it's possible to live differently, they also realize how much more uh, resources we use, which we don't need. So it also uh, brings a awareness. And especially when we come together as multiple movements, as multiple communities, and we are not a single freaking out uh, community hugging trees on the countryside, but we actually become a systemic movement uh, with political advocacy, with um, well-structured organization. So we also representing a quite large group of the society. It also becomes a way to 
um, mainstream our solutions and to advocate for, for our way of living. So even though it's difficult day to day, both to build the local community and to invest energy into work as a network, it seems uh, bringing a lot of functions. And I very much uh, like Alex's addition about exponential growth. Uh, I feel like I'm somewhere here <laughs> almost um, losing hope that, that things can change, but perhaps we are somewhere on a threshold when it starts to hit uh, the mainstream society also more largely. Thank you, Alisa. It's clear that we are in a tipping point uh, and, uh, and we can continue growing. So in many ways we need to be grown and in many others, maybe we need to grow too. No? So, um, yeah, but how, if we could, if we could give some advices to the people that is right now watching us uh, about how, um, where, where could we start? Uh, what are the requisites to maybe success or what can be the, the pitfalls? I mean, I don't know, Philippa, could you may, maybe in your experience give us a few advices about, um, yeah, some, but how to organize effective community-led um, action. Mm -hmm. Look. Okay, so one of the things that I think that really need to happen is people like us that are already involved in, in, in something, we need to be good at creating the space for people to step in, you know? So for me, one of the things that we need to know, need to do as these people holding these, these ideas and the experimentation is tell the good story, tell our stories, what we are doing to inspire, and to tell if you want to do something like that, you can step in doing that. And it could be many, many movements, many, it can be permaculture, it can be uh, uh, eco villages, it can be transition, it can be, and most of us, we, we are in, in all of them anyway. So, and then for the transition movement, for example, this is how I, I know what we say is how it all starts is without a lot of formalism. If you are at in your place feeling that something needs to change, and you know that you could change it if you would find people that would support you and you could support another person. So the first step is, where is my group? Where is my team? And you, there are so many ways to do that. So, and then you could talk about stuff. What is inspiring me? Um, let's have a conversation about how we, how is our community here? What could we do? And you start by there. You, you start by there. And then, and then, for example, in the transition movement, there is, there is a, an essential guide of how to start a transition initiative. You could follow that as well. You could watch movies and then you could uh, go and invite other people to, to, to step in. This is how we start is to talk to have an honest conversation about what we would like to change in ourselves, in our system, and what do I have the energy to do, and what do I need to put in place for that to happen? I think, I think this is the, 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 the quick question, the quick question about the, the quick answer for that so simple question of how do we start? Yeah. Is it is it what you would expect me to say, Juan? Yeah, did I answer? That's 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 fine. I mean, it can be replied in many ways. So and think, well, think, there is one yeah. thing that um, I would like to say. There is something about the state of mind that I would invite people to be in when you start a work like that. There is. There is a, a difficult work of a journey of consciousness that you have to, um, I think it's important for you to know that you will need to look inside and at the same time to be compassionate about other people with you doing that journey because we live in a system that is very fixed, you know, 
to go to, to experiment to to do change, it is a very difficult thing. And we need to support each other and to understand that transition for me, it's a journey. And some of us, we are very advanced in some stuff, but we are very not very advanced in other stuff. We need support. So for me, in a group, the compassion is very important and the intention for consciousness is very important as well. Thank you, Philippa. It's clear that both inner work and outer work, they need to go hand in hand. That's, that's clear. And all of us, we have experienced that uh, maybe some, some type of, uh, of, of, of work is easier than, than other. And well, we need to, to find a way to, to, to jump out of our comfort zone and learn with the support from, from others. This is a process. It's, it's clear. And of course, we need to manifest these physically in our, in our environment. Also, we need to create projects and, and so on. So just a very quick complementary advice to what, to what Philippa said is that um, the best way to raise awareness about the current situation about that and, uh, and, and about the possibility to create alternatives is by doing things, is by, is by showing an example. So please, let's not try to start in your community group with something huge at the very beginning, but with something that it can be, well, feasible, something simple, but that can, can be, you know, funny, can be, can be nice, visible, that can engage with, with the other. And then maybe the snowball will start to, to, to roll. So that can be maybe another, another advice. And don't try to reinvent the wheel because everything is already more or less invited. So, Look, if other people is start is is already doing things, and 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 not you can do it with other people, so much much better. Alex, I'm gonna go with you with the last question uh, that connects very well with with this one. It's about collaboration. Uh, we have talked in this um, in this conversation together about. Um, stop with the frontiers and, and, and building bridges and, and working together. So, and Ecolisa in itself uh, as a meta network and the wider network with many other uh, partnerships, uh, partners that, 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 that we have um, is an example of that experiment. So in your opinion and your, your experience, Alex, how can we better collaborate? How can we collaborate collaborate more effectively across different movements and across different social sectors? Ooh, that's a tough one. Yeah, I mean, yes. Try, yeah. try to, to say something. Well, about let me start with a metaphor. Uh, doing some financial research, I found out that in Romania, the people have more money in banks as savings than the entire state budget. So... Uh, we could run the country if we wanted to, if we were well enough coordinated. Um, and I'm looking at, okay, who is the community? Who are, which ones are these different sectors? And I was looking at, okay, we have the people who have their own communities. Maybe if they're not politically involved, they have their work community, friend community, sewing club, acting class, basketball groups. We have civil society, like a next level, another sector, let's say, civil society, which means NGOs. And I tend to put eco-villages in that place as well. Like they're, they're big enough political power, let's say. They're sort of their own government in a, in a way. Uh, we have the educational sector, universities, alternative education, and all these sorts of uh, you know, alternative uh, trainers and workshops. And then we go on to the business community, like the corporations and high end, like large scale entrepreneurs. And of course the political community and conventional state governments. So we have to find a way to put a spear, like to build a bridge through these guys. So everybody gets a chance to contribute. And there's a lot of information exchange between the, the levels that makes well, the available resources and nutrients, as I call them, go to the, the plant in need, to the project in need, the community in need, et cetera, et cetera. 
So I think like a big part of it is actually facilitation, knowing how to facilitate a group meeting. We have to know first we, we have to know ourselves and then we have to be okay with ourselves. And then we have to learn about each other. So, you know, actively asking, uh, but this is increasingly difficult in these times, but still we can go to events, organize events, on, if, even if they're online. There's a strong social aspect. We, we first have to meet each other. Um, but I think this is the most important thing, how to facilitate, how to hold the space, how to keep a group focused, relaxed, mindful of each other, but not to the point of them yielding. We want people to bring what's alive in them through this facilitation process, because we all come from a different place. Um, we need to celebrate. Okay, facilitate, yes, celebrate. We need to celebrate. That's We're it. doing projects. We're working our asses off. But uh, how are we different to the nine to five rat race society if we do not offer quality of life and, you know, celebration of uh, the sacred inside or whatever everybody believes is sacred and fun and relaxing and, you know, puts a little, like, you know, a shiny little smiley face on the eye of life. I'm so poetic, I know. Um, and we need, because like we need biodiversity, we need all these people to come together because they bring expertise and they bring, you know, how do we make this happen? If we only have one perspective, that's already like failure. And I think like the, pra the most practical thing would be to have uh, facilitators, like community-led initiative facilitators, people who actively like, this is my main job. I, today, I'm just going to see who's like in this country, in the civil society, who's working on this project and how I can weave different NGOs or people working on the project to bring more expertise and bring a coalition. But I'm afraid of actually of raising the scale too high so we don't just become centralized again. It's a thing of balance there. And an another way, like, okay, so we have facilitate, celebrate, and we have communicate. Ask people speak different languages. People across sectors speak different languages, not other languages. They have a different, like, ritualistic tribe, let's say. So learn how to show yourself, how to explain yourself to people, and how to bring people together. Another aspect of communicate, show yourself, show your work. Yes, I know you don't believe it's perfect, but it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to show that it comes from a heart and from another place and it's actually doable by people with their own two hands and with some a few simple tools and and i have two more <laughs> go ahead go ahead quickly fundraise. because like this we will have some time for the, for the others yeah. no, go. We, fundraise go ask for money ask for resources it's so simple to ask <laughs> sometimes you get a yes hello this is my project we need this much uh, uh -huh. for this can we please have it do you have it barter ask money is all over all over the place and people are spending it on all the stupid things possible so they're gonna spend it on your project and your project is actually serving to regenerate so yeah even better they're even happier to give it to a place that matters and then finally yes obtain a yield show at least in romania if you don't show that you obtain a yield or you're not financially viable or something people are not really gonna... Okay, this is an example for Romania, but we also need to show that our way of, especially in permaculture, which is kind of technical, and farmers have an ego almost as big as fishermen. You have to show that your system is, is worthwhile. Thank you so much, Alex. Yeah, well, I think, I think collaboration and... Yeah, I go to you, Filippo. One, one, one. Collaboration is a crucial word for the future. If we aren't able to collaborate, if we aren't able to understand each other and work together, we will not be able to, to, to succeed. That's, that's clear. Um, Filippa, briefly, because we will go to the questions in, in the chat. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to say something about... Um, about the, the work of communities in as agents of change. 
we find groups and identities and we, 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 we do like a membrane around the group, right? Because we find the people that prefer to focus on a certain area of work and you, skill, you have certain skills and so on and you develop it. And we have this, this vision of changing the world we live in. Many other groups are finding their pairs and finding their context and their, and their places of change. One of the things that is not good is when we compete with each other for a, to, to do a change that we, we all want, you know? So there is something about the essence, our essence and finding our essence and be clear about our common visions and be clear about our ethics and agreements, trust agreements between the groups. And then we work together respecting the different identities. And we respect the different identities. And on top, we support each other with the skills we have different. So um, the, the thing of groups competing with each other is something that is not is 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 not acceptable in 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 the task that we want to do that is very difficult so i just wanted to say that because you when you are in a local community doing your work one of the things that is very difficult is you feel very alone if you are not careful and the fact that we connect in networks with your network and with others and collaborations, you feel supported and you feel that you are part of a global movement supporting each other to do that change. So for me, it's not only in big movements like the eco villages, the permaculture of the transition alone, it's being all together and supporting each other in the things that we are the best. That's me. Thank you, Filippa. I think you have summarized very well. Uh, we do everything. Uh, and each of us, uh, and each movement, each initiative, each community may have more expertise or experience or um, capacity to do a certain thing. So let's not compete for one thing. Let's try to find what's the best I can contribute to this process. Let's find our our uh, space in in all of this, and uh, and let's do it together. Yeah. So, I think now it's time. Um, we have a few more minutes for questions in in the chat to um, uh, to reply a few of them uh, among all of us. And I don't know if um, Paulina or Jim you can support us with with this because. I've seen a lot of movement in the chat, and um, maybe if not, I can I can look a little bit in the chat. But I know Paulina, if you can help us here. Uh, I would encourage people to put questions in the chat now if you have something in mind that hasn't been answered yet. Okay. Meanwhile, uh, okay. Uh, I just yeah. wanted to, uh, oh, I just wanted to express that I was very impressed with the chat. Um, among all these online events, uh, it's very often happens that people are rather critical and ask a lot of questions, which challenge, which is fun and provocative. But I was really uh, touched and melted by seeing so many so supportive uh, and such open shared. It feels like. Uh, I came to some community which is existing here already. So yeah, I think this is also a good example of how the connection uh, is to happen from that supportive space. Thank you a lot. Yeah, that's that's great. Mm, well, it's, it's just it's just too much. There are comments there that it is hard for me to like to find a question here because I don't know if it's replied or or not. Um, I see uh, one question, Juan. Please go ahead, Filippa. There is a question there from Mary Thorpe. How do we network ourselves 
uh, throughout each nation. Mm -hmm. Who would like to, well, uh, Jim, if you want to say something. Yeah, I'm just else. saying in, in light of the time, uh, maybe answer that question, but it'd be nice to just take a minute each of, from each of you just to make some kind of a final uh, summary statement. That would be good because you've all had such a rich dialogue. I'd love to hear some final words from each of you and then I can wrap it up. Oh, okay, great. Thank you, Jim. Um, I don't know if someone wants to reply quickly to the question that, that Philippa said uh, before. Uh, Alex, you want to, well, Alex, go ahead. The one uh, quickly I because we don't have much time. But I can also answer this one. Back when I was a woofer, I imagined it was very hard to find a place to stay and to, it was very difficult to kind of live. And I imagined like this worldwide network of farms or eco villages or places where you can go and give value through your work and receive value through education and, uh, you know, a place to stay and something to eat. If I, I used to think is per, if permaculture is so great, and so abundant, why can't it do this? And now I see that you can actually do it. Okay, COVID travel restrictions have been like intruded in my worldview, but still, you can still do this. Thank you, Alex. Alisa. I'd like to add when uh, the before COVID era, uh, all the organizations within ECOLIS have annual meetings and uh, conferences and also much more of national and regional convergences, permaculture convergences, um, eco-village uh, national networks meetings, and also big annual conferences when a few hundreds of people would come together. ECOLIS itself has a general assembly and it was great moments of coming together physically and this is when the bonding actually happens. It really means a lot. But now when... Um, we have a, both a symptom, but also a model of the world without physical traveling, which also might mean that if not Corona, but resources wise, we will need to limit our um, yeah, traveling adventures in the future. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to use this chance of social media. Of course, it has its backlashes and uh, data mining and everything, but we have a great chance of using this, this exactly towards social media, people coming together and exchanging. Um, even though I believe that it is a temporary flash in the human history and just resources wise, uh, which go into streaming, <laughs> into technically supporting it, we will not be able to keep it up. So probably we have this um, short momentum in human history when we can exchange something very important from all parts of the world in such a short time. And perhaps already in our generation, human history go back apart into our regions and try to implement this knowledge. So I'm really grateful for that and I hope we can use it wisely. Thank you, Lisa. Few words, Felipa. Yeah, uh, so I, I will not say, because I agree quite a lot with what I heard about. So I, I just wanted to com complement something that I have been observing as a co international coordinator of a movement that is in 50 countries. I think that there is a, a little trick, and I think that there is where this question can come from, is the transition movement and the other movements as well is rooted in the local. So it is very important, the context, the culture, it is very important that you protect that in a movement that is decentralized. You are not looking for an harmonized way of doing stuff. You want to protect the way that people are doing on the ground. But at the same time, we need to be working together. So in the, in the hubs group that I, I coordinate, that is like the, the coordination cells of the regions of the not always country, um, uh, we are like 25 now, 25 uh, countries, uh, hubs working together, and all of them have their cultures. But we have this human essence that we need to find to be really connected, our human nature, our human culture, you know, uh, and, and 
what is the essence of that that allows us to be connected, supporting each other in difference, in the diversity, and at the same time, uh, avoiding the pitfalls of uh, assumptions and judgment. And that is part of the big thing of creating this common culture. And for me, this is something that I've been obsessing with. You know, how do I keep myself rooted and listen what the person is saying without, uh, with the exercise of the assumptions. Um, so for me, this is one of my quests in my life. Um, and it's tricky, but it's done, it is possible when we really listen. Uh, and when there is a conflict to create a space for uh, truth and trust. That's me. Thank you, Philippa. Well, I'm very, very happy that we're having this conversation between, between friends talking about things that, that they have changed our lives and, uh, and we're putting all our love and energy into this in many times. And um, sometimes it's hard. I have to say that I felt lonely many times and sometimes it's, it's difficult, you know, and uh, I, just in this last minute, closing my case, for example, this year has been very difficult. I became father uh, seven months ago, just when the pandemic started, and we 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 get locked in Spain. So just few days after, I, I became father, <laughs> and um, with um, with a lot of work and and the baby and all this atmosphere that everything is going wrong. A lot of friends uh, losing the job, and and you know like everything is depressing and difficult and but um but still i think um we need to be to we, we need to 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 find a way to 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 be engaged and 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 connected to 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 to, to create a positive uh, and possible regenerative future no and by connecting with all of you uh, I feel more empowered, no, and, and I, I, it seems that it makes sense the work that I'm that I'm doing, even though it's just uh, a little seed. So it's it's great to to feel that I'm part of, of this family of this community. Not only, of course, there are the, the few people that we are here, but much beyond that. And I want to thank you all for coming here, uh, and to say thank you to to everyone that is doing something uh, in any part of the world. I also would like to thank uh, Humanity Rising for um, holding uh, all these Humanity Rising Summit. And I would like to invite um, everyone here. I'm going to share very briefly my screen here. I think you can see this is um, the information if you want to join us uh, in, in the Communities of Future program. And in the 2nd of December, we will hold the third uh, session that is going to be about communities of practice. And communities of practice is about bringing together people that, that is experimenting on different topics. And we are creating an ecosystem of communities of practice. One of them is the municipalities in transition community of practice, and there are many others, uh, all of them working at community uh, led level. So, uh, I don't know, I had the same problem before. I just want to stop sharing my screen. And I don't know if I can't. Okay, no, thank you so much. Um, so I want to stop uh, to stop here. Thank you to, to everyone. So Jim, over to you again. And I hope, um, yeah, I hope people have enjoyed and uh, let's continue this trip together. Thank you, Juan, uh, Elisa, Philippa, Alex, Paulina, uh, for a wonderful session. Um, just two very quick notes as we close. One, uh, Philippa, I was so struck by your story that you were, you were, in some ways, were in Brussels minding your own business, and all of a sudden something happens, you're seized. 
you quit your job, you embark into the unknown, and here you are. And I just think that's that's beautiful, and that's a model of how the passionate life should be lived, not in the safety of a bureaucracy or a convention, but on the frontiers of human development and social change at a critical moment uh, in history. So I, I know all of you could tell the same story in different ways. Elisa, how you ended up in the middle of the Baltic, Alex, you know, in Romania and, and wolfing around. And it's, it's, a, it's beautiful and inspiring to see this happening. It's, uh, it's humanity rising at its best. The second point I'd like to make is just take up Juan's question again, of radical collaboration. You know, I, I went through a thought experiment early on uh, during the pandemic, and I thought to myself, if there was one thing that the progressive movement could do that could save the world, what is it? What one thing? And to me, the answer is radical collaboration. If you think about the millions and millions of people around the world, the millions of NGOs, human beings like you are taking care as best they can of every conceivable issue on planet Earth. There are hundreds, thousands of NGOs uh, working on every conceivable issue. And most of them are live, working in isolation with one another. And that's why we are so weak. If we would all come together, even in one country, let alone globally, the world would never be the same again. But somehow we can't figure out how to do it. So I just want, I want to honor this session by leaving all of us in the question. How do we more radically collaborate in this moment so that the change we are dedicating every ounce of our life and strength to achieve is in fact accomplished? Because we're running out of time. It's not about what we know or don't know. We already know all we need. It's not about whether the solutions exist or not. The solutions are lying all over the place, many for decades and decades. It's about how effectively we're cooperating. So this has been a wonderful session. It's been inspiring and heartful and, and um, it's increased my optimism about the human future. So thank you all. And then tomorrow we're gonna to go to Russia, uh, to Vladimir Posner, and uh, who's one of the leading uh, television journalists uh, was back in the Soviet Union, has been working with a number of us for decades. Uh, he was there during the Gorbachev Reagan period when a number of us were engaging in citizen diplomacy. Um, uh, between Russia and the United States and Europe when the nuclear danger was so intense and, and we citizens just threw ourselves into the maelstrom and we made a difference. We made a difference and participated in some of the great nuclear reduction dynamics uh, of that uh, era. So Vladimir Posner tomorrow with Jim Hickman uh, the original citizen diplomat, and Cynthia Lazaroff, who's been at this for, for decades. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful session, and we'll be commenting on Putin and Trump and, you know, what's going on in current politics, but within the context of some radical collaboration that started back in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, and has continued to the present day. So thank you, everybody. Wonderful session. And we'll see you all again tomorrow on Humanity Rising, 5 p.m. Central European time. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Tim. Great session, everyone.
can we continue 